Thank you, everyone. Um, at last year's CFO Forum, uh, one name appeared on nearly every single feedback sheet, and it was Andrew McLeod, and uh, we're absolutely stoked to have him back. Um, obviously, it was Andrew McLeod in the positive parts, um, and uh, to have him back in Australia and, uh, and to speak at our conference is a, is a real thrill for us. He's also uh, facilitating the session after lunch as well, so um, a couple of... Certainly getting Andrew's expertise for a couple of hours is something we're really pleased to do. Uh, pleased to have, I should say. Um, by way of introduction, uh, Andrew McLeod currently sits on the board of Cornerstone Capital, the Sustainable Accounting Advisory Board, the steering committee of the World Economic Forum, Future of Civil Society Project, the UN's expert group on responsible business and investment in high-risk areas, King's College Humanitarian Futures Program Advisory Board, as well as numerous charities. Andrew also ma maintains a commission as an officer in the Australian Army. Um, he was previously General Manager of Community Communications and External Relations for Global Giant Rio Tinto, covering economies and communities as diverse as Mongolia, the United States, South Africa, Australia, Peru and others giving him a true global exposure. Uh, prior to that, Andrew was CEO for the Committee of Melbourne. And I'd like to hand it over to Andrew to, uh, for the next session. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, it's an important change that's coming and confronting the non-for-profit world generally, globally, but also here in Australia. And the challenge is how to build real partnerships and new fundraising mechanisms and funding streams to ensure that your organisations can continue to deliver the services that they're going to deliver. You don't need to read this, this is written in the book, it's just a summary of what I'm going to talk you through today. How do we build these new partnerships based on outcomes, based on measures and based on genuine shared value or partnerships with other private sector organisations where both sides win. I know a number of organisations are doing very well at changing the mindset from a recipient of philanthropy mindset to a genuine partner with whichever donor or funder they're building a partnership with. And it's a challenge for each of the organisations to make that shift because there is no long-term sustainable model that relies 100% on the goodwill of philanthropy. So let's move through and look at how the face of the world is changing and options for your organisations to enhance and improve your financial sustainability. And it all boils down to the catchphrase shared value, in my view. And like a, catch, a lot of catchphrases, there are are a lot of myths around what it is and what it means. So let me talk you through what shared value is and why it's important. Shared value as a terminology came up when professors Michael Porter and Mark Kramer at Harvard Business School wrote their article, Reinventing Capitalism. And they proposed mechanisms by which new uh, partnerships can be built. The best example to explain what shared value is is the BHP anti-malaria example that I'll come to in just a second. But before I talk about what shared value is, let me talk about what it's not. It's not corporate social responsibility. And in fact, if you want to guarantee which one of your partner organisations is a little bit behind the eight ball in its thinking, a little bit old style in its thinking, if they still have a corporate social responsibility department and using those words. If I am to overgeneralise, Corporate social responsibility is corporate philanthropy. Funding a tennis club or the opera or whatever just happens to be the favoured charity of the senior executives. That's what corporate social responsibility is. So very much a corporate social responsibility partnership depends on the goodwill of the two or three key senior executives in that company or organisation. When those senior executives move on and new senior executives come in, there will be other favoured options. But more importantly, the thing about CSR that I don't like is that it makes social responsibility 
someone's job in the company instead of everybody's job. I prefer to look at companies that look at each of their external facing units, human resources, procurement, communities, communications, and ensure that each one of those external facing units, and sales if it's a sale-based organisation, understands that its corporate footprint, the way a corporation behaves in each of those external facing ways, human resources, procurement, sales, communities, communications, can have a net positive impact where they're working, if they design it to have a net positive impact. And a net positive impact both to communities and to the corporation. And the critical bit is that there must be a positive contribution to both. Corporate social responsibility is a cost item on a, bal a balance sheet. A well-designed shared value program is not. And let me talk about it by giving the examples. BHP Billiton Anti-Malaria Program. I'm gonna wrap this up later on in the day and bring it smack bang into relevance to your organisations. But let me talk about this one. I like it because it's very, very effective. BHP ran an anti-malaria program that reduced adult malaria infection from 92% of the population to 5.6. Lovely program. In fact, the world's most effective anti-malaria program in Mosul, Mozambique. Far more effective than anything UNICEF has ever done. Far more effective than anything the World Health Organisation has ever done. Is it corporate social responsibility? Some people would be tempted to say yes. Here is a company working in a community in the developing world that has identified malaria as one of the biggest problems in the community and is funding a program to remove that malaria. If the story stopped there, then you might be tempted to say it's corporate social responsibility. Well, let's go to the next step. The reduction in adult malaria infections led to a reduction in absenteeism in the workforce because of improved community health. People were not absent from work because either they were sick or a critical family member was sick. And absenteeism dropped measurably from 22% to 2 That increased the productivity of BHP's assets, an aluminium smelter, by an amount higher than the cost of the program. In other words, they had a measurable increase in productivity higher than the cost of actually implementing the program. So the anti-malaria program, when measured properly, was profitable. To which many in the left wing said, see, they're a big evil mining company doing big evil things and only worried about profit, aren't they bad? To which my response was, no. Who's actually lost in this one? Right? Senior executives have won. They've got more productivity out of their asset. They get better short-term and long-term incentive bonuses. Well done. Shareholder wins, higher profitability, better dividends. But the community has won too. It's just had its adult malaria infection drop from 92% to 5.6. Who lost in that narrative? Nobody. So why do we kick them? because they're more profitable. One of the problems we have in the left wing, of which I'm one, is that when we talk about sustainability, we talk about two legs of sustainability a lot. We talk about social sustainability, which we need to, and we talk about environmental sustainability, which we need to. But we also almost never speak about financial sustainability, do we? And what BHP found through that program is environmentally sustainable, it's socially sustainable, and they've created a model where it's financially sustainable because they created a narrative by which someone will always fund it. If this was a program based on corporate philanthropy, corporate social responsibility, and BHP had a financial crisis, would they be tempted to cut the program? Perhaps yes. But if it is measurably impacting positively on the bottom line of the company, will they ever cut the program? No, it would make no sense. This program is contributing positively to the bottom line and all the secondary impacts on higher community acceptance, lower community risk, 
in their operations. It's a no-brainer. That is the best example of shared value I've seen because it is creating new value which is shared between the community and the company. Some people misinterpret shared value and think it is existing profit that I share with a stakeholder. But it's not. Shared value is creating a new level of profit in which you share that profit between the corporation and the stakeholders. In other words, it's your classic win-win-win. The thing about shared value is that it's not new. Michael Porter and Mark Kramer might have put the stamp on it in their articles coming out of Harvard Business School, but it's not new. It's not something that has been recently invented. It's just something that's been recently badged. It's actually smart, good business. Let me give you two other examples. Chilean mining companies' transport of sulfuric acid. Where is their shared value in this? And this is interesting. I got a call. This mining company said, we have to move sulfuric acid from port to mine. It's a few hundred kilometres from the coast. And we have broadly two options. We can move this sulfuric acid by road or we can move it by rail. The freight company owns both the road transport and the rail transport, so they're price gouging on the rail. And therefore, we're minded to ship the sulfuric acid by road because it's cheaper. And I said to the company, well, let's think of it in two ways. You're all CFOs. So we know the difference between the profit and loss report and the balance sheet. We know the difference between value and cost. So let's look at this sulfuric acid question from a profit and loss perspective. Okay, it's a cheaper freight rate to go by road, without a doubt, and therefore more profitable to go by road, therefore let's go by road. Okay, let's now look at it from a value perspective. What's the impact on the balance sheet? Resource companies particularly value their assets through a process of calculating net present value of the assets. Some of you may be very familiar with that, in fact, more familiar than me with the calculation, but let me walk through it in broad terms. How do you calculate net present value of an asset? Let's take a mine in Chile. So, righto, here is this mine, let's say it's a copper mine. It's got an ore body. We need to calculate, as a mining company, is it worth investing in this ore body? So let's figure out how much does it cost to own, build, and operate the mine over the life of the ore body. For a simple piece of maths, let's say this ore body is predicted to last 100 years. Let's say the, the, the really smart people get together with an Excel spreadsheet and a few calculators, and they figure out to build and operate this mine over the 100 years will be $100 billion in discounted present terms. Net present cost of the operation, $100 billion. What's the net present revenue? Well, let's say some other smart people get together, they make their predictions on what's going to happen to ore prices and all of this sort of stuff, and they say, well, we estimate that there will be $150 billion of revenue over the next 100 years. $150 billion of revenue versus $100 billion in cost, does that make the net present value $50 billion? No, it doesn't. We discount that future revenue for a number of discounting factors. The three most important ones are sovereign risk, the cost of holding money, and community risk. For ease of maths, let's say we discount under each of those heads by 10%. So we discount that future revenue by 10% for sovereign risk, community risk, and the cost of holding money. That's 30% discount over uh, that 100-year period. 30% on 150 billion, $45 billion. Therefore, net present revenue is 105 billion. The 150 minus the 45 discount. Net present cost, 100 billion. Therefore, net present value, 105 billion minus 100 billion, $5 billion. And the powerful thing about the net present value calculation is that value, $5 billion, it's, is what's declared to the stock exchange. That's how much that asset is worth on paper to the company today. That impacts on the share price today. That impacts on executive remuneration today. What happens if we change 
one of those figures. What happens if we change community risk from a 10% discount to a 5% discount? Well, 5% on 150 billion is 7.5 billion. So we reduce the discount on future revenue by 7.5 billion. Therefore, we increase future revenue by 7.5 billion. Therefore, we increase net present value by 7.5 billion. So the net present value goes from 5 billion to 12.5 billion more than doubling the value of the asset as you declare it to the stock exchange today, as you determine senior executive remuneration today. But can you just willy-nilly change a number? You guys are accountants. You know you can't just willy-nilly change a number. Well, probably some of you have changed willy-nilly some numbers. If you have, give me a call. I'm still doing this year's tax return. To change a number like your discount rate, you need to have a valid argument to change the number. So you need to have implemented a genuine community acceptance program that has changed that community risk, that's genuinely lowered that community risk. Not whitewashing, not blah blah, not painting rocks white, but genuine outreach programs that have community acceptance. So let's bring us back to this Chilean example. What is the difference in risk between transporting by road and transporting by rail? I see three areas of risk that exist by road transport that don't exist on rail transport. And those three areas of risk are particulate pollution, which in every developing economy is always blamed on the mining company, road congestion. It doesn't matter how much the mining company spends on improving the roads, the mining company will always be blamed for the road congestion. And then a risk of catastrophic spill, which is much more real on road than it is on rail. In other words, if you choose as this Chilean mining company the road option rather than the rail option, your risk is higher. Therefore, your discount rate on future revenue over life of mine must be higher. Therefore, your future revenue is lower and therefore the net present value of your asset is lower. So a question for the senior executives of this Chilean mining company is, when you look at things from a value perspective rather than a profit and loss perspective, does the cheaper freight rate on the road option decrease your future costs and therefore increase your net present value by an amount higher or lower than the increased risk lowers your future revenue and therefore lowers your net present value? Do you follow? It's an interesting challenge to which the senior executives say, oh, well, can you tell us the answer? To which I said, no, but I can lock you in a room and facilitate the discussion until you come up with the answer because you have to own the answer. Ah, oh, we might not do that. Well, that's okay. Then you're valuing the change in risk at zero. And whatever the change in risk is, it is not zero. And it's this discussion that senior executives will point back to if something goes wrong. So you go from one very clear example, the BHP anti-malaria example, very clear to track through the net be benefit. The Chilean example is to show why the CFOs, the accountants, are very, very important to sit down with the senior executives and explain what these ramifications are in value terms as well as profit and loss terms. So, potentially, the decision to choose road or rail will impact on the share price of that company because it will impact on the value that you declare to the stock exchange. Maybe not by much in this example, but it will. Interesting. It will come back to Jobs Australia and member organisations shortly. Let me talk through another example. Rio Tinto in Mongolia. I talk mainly about the resource companies because some of their examples are so clear and really easy to show. This one, outsourced procurement in Mongolia. What did Rio Tinto do? Rio Tinto is developing a mine called Old Utogoi in the south of Mongolia, in the South Gobi Desert. There is nothing there but sand and little desert creatures about this big that come out at night time and some camels. It's about 60 kilometres from the Chinese border 
and it drops down to about minus 45 degrees Celsius in winter. I've got a bizarre photograph, actually short video, from two winters ago. We flew out of Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, officially the world's coldest capital city and one of the most polluted, down to Dalingzagad, which is the capital of the South Gobi region. Dalingzagad is a full 20 degrees warmer than Ulaanbaatar, or more accurately, 20 degrees less cold. So when Ulaanbaatar was minus 37, when we hopped on the plane, we got off the plane in Dalingzagad at minus 17, and we've got a photo of us outside the airport standing around in just our shirts and no hat or gloves because we felt warmer until someone told us it was still minus 17. It's an amazing thing, the human body, of how quickly it can adapt. And I still can't believe I was standing there with a shirt, no gloves and no hats, and it was minus 17 when I was squealing this morning because it was nine. Positive. Now, what did, Mon what did Rio Tinto do in Mongolia? So we're building a mine in the middle of the South Gobi Desert where there is absolutely nothing. Trying to figure out how to get critical elements that the mine needs. Boots, uniforms, helmets, water, bread. Three and a half thousand construction workers need three and a half thousand meals three times a day. A lot of primary produce. Where do you get it all? In the short term, it would be very easy for Rio Tinto to look over the border into China, it's only 60 kilometres away, and buy everything there and just import it all. Makes sense in the short term. It makes much more sense in the long term to build the inherent capacity of the Mongolian economy to produce those things necessary for the mine. Boots, uniforms, helmets, bottled water, bread, etc. So what did Rio Tinto do? Rio Tinto created a whole lot of microfinance loans and gave microfinance loans largely to women. Why do we give microfinance loans to women? Anyone? They're more efficient. It has nothing to do with diversity. It's all the data shows that female recipients of microfinance loans pay the loans back at a rate 80 to 90% higher than men. Men have this habit of drinking microfinance loans and women have a habit of investing microfinance loans. Call me a sexist if you like, but microfinance loans to women are better. And they said to these women, righto, we're going to give you these loans and you have to build businesses. And they businesses had to provide materials for the mine on the following three conditions. Condition one, you comply with Rio's global standards on occupational health and safety. And we will send our OHS experts in to teach you OHS. Why? Not just because it's nice and not just because Rio's worried about reputation, but Rio's got all of the data spat out by the accountants to show that occupational health and safety is cheaper. It makes much more financial sense over the long term to do the right thing because people dying in your workforce is expensive. You've got to re-recruit, you've got to retrain, you've got to rebuild teams, and there's lots of people like you that have sat around and crunched numbers into an Excel spreadsheet to say, here, doing the right thing is cheaper. It's kind of shared value. So condition one, you've got to comply with our occupational health and safety. Condition two is you have to meet our quality control standards. And the logic's quite simple. If you produce boots and helmets and uniforms that don't live up to our standards, we won't buy them. If they do live up to our standards, we will buy them. It's in my interest as the mining company to make sure your quality as the supplier lives up to my standards so I can buy your product because the whole reason of setting up your business is so I can buy your product. So I send in my quality control people to make sure your quality is good. The third condition is, and this is really interesting, you have to work with Rio Tinto to market your product to every other mine in Mongolia. Why? Why would Rio want the supplier to supply their product to every other mine in Mongolia? What do you reckon? Pardon? Economy of scale. You got that 50% right, if I can increase your productivity, improve your output, and lower your unit cost, I lower my input cost. 
but don't I therefore lower the input cost for every other mine in Mongolia? And the answer is yes, but I'm a copper mine and the other mines in Mongolia are coal mines and gold mines and I'm not competing with the, the coal mine and the gold mine in Mongolia, I'm competing with the copper mine in Chile. So if I can lower my unit cost by getting you to sell your products to other companies, I win and you win. It's an interesting shared value proposition. The point in telling you this is the people who figured all this out aren't the senior executives without the accounting backgrounds. It's the bean counters. It's the bean counters. It's the accountants. It's the CFOs who come in and say, have you thought about it this way? Have you measured it this way? Have you fully understood the downstream impact of your decisions. It's people like you. So let's now talk about shared value. Bring it back to Jobs Australia. Whose job is it in the organisation to think about it? What is the link with corporate social responsibility where corporate social responsibility programs still exist? What does it mean for members of this organisation well, I would say, and I continue to say, that shared value is the job of all external facing parts of a business or organisation. Basically everyone. Human resources, procurement, sales, communities, communications. They're the big ones. Human resources. Interesting, isn't it? I'll come back to human resources. What's the link with CSR. Imagine if you had a partnership with a non, sorry, for a, a, with a for-profit organisation that still talked about CSR and they did corporate philanthropy and they threw some money your way. And you came back up to them and you said, thanks, but you know, if we adjusted the project and we adjusted the program this way, this way and this way, you will be more profitable. Do you think that organisation will be interested in listening to you? If you said on one hand, thanks for the money, there's the receipt, or you said on the other hand, thanks for the money, but did you know if you restructured it this way, this way, and this way, you're more profitable? Which story do you think is more likely to raise a stronger partnership with that organisation? When you're looking at partnerships, too many people, in my view, in the non-for-profit sector, view a partnership with an organisation in the for-profit sector as a partnership where you give me money, full stop. Value comes one way. Oh, you might feel nice. You can say something in your publicity or your sustainability report. You can do a little newsletter to your staff to say how good you are. Yeah, okay. Let's cut the crap. Who listened to my, who was here in my presentation last year? Anyone? I think it was a couple of you. Remember one of the things I put up last year? I said, right, let's see if we can figure out how you create a shared value narrative with Jobs Australia non-for-profit member organisations and partner private sector companies. Remember the question I asked? I came in and I said, who here works in the non-for-profit sector? Let's do it today. Who here works in the non-for-profit sector? Right, most people. Who here is looking for a financial partnership with a for-profit organisation? How many of you have gone into, or members of your organisation, gone into a for-profit organisation and said something along the lines of, please give me some money? A version of that, right? The people whose hands are not up and not being honest. Every one of your organisations has said a version of that. So let's think about it another way. How many of your organisations have data that proves that long-term unemployed or people suffering a disability who gain employment are better employees when measured through loyalty, longevity within those companies. Most of your organisations have that data to show that. Long-term unemployed when they've given, been given a job or people with a disability who get a job become more loyal, tend to stay in organisations longer and therefore are a more profitable employee. 
And the proposition I put, or the challenge I put, the idea I put, someone is beeping and it's not me. No, definitely not me. Who's beeping? Anyway, I'm going to ignore it. Can you hear it? It's gone now, whatever it was. Okay, so the proposition I put forward is instead of going to a for-profit organisation, knocking on the door and saying, please give me some money and what you can then do is write something nice in your sustainability report, if instead you went to human resources, the external facing arm of that organisation, and you said, I can give you access to a pool of employees where the data shows their loyalty is higher, their retention is higher, therefore your recruitment costs will drop and therefore you'll become more profitable. Because if you believe that your clients and your organisations do exhibit those characteristics of high loyalty and better retention, and your organisations tell me you have the data to prove that, then don't you have a marketable commodity? You're not asking for a one-way partnership now. You're asking for a two-way partnership. I will give you access to a pool of better employees if you help fund that. We can even create a lovely spreadsheet to show how, on balance, the company might be more profitable as a result. Maybe, you're gonna to have to crunch the numbers on that. And this is where shared value gets really interesting. So if you fund me $100, I can give you access to employees that over time will save your recruitment costs 110, or whatever the number just happens to be. Or even if you're just working from a CSR and a philanthropy viewpoint, uh, you're giving me $100 as a donation, but did you realise that you can measure a net improvement of $90? So it might not be profitable, but it's just reducing their cost line from 100 to 90 or 100 to 10. Do you follow? If you understand the business model of the partner organisation you're working with, if you understand your clients and what they mean in dollar terms to partners, and it's very hard for those who come out of a left-wing background, who come out of a non-for-profit background, to mount an argument based on dollar value of people. Because we like to say we care about people. It's not about the money. It's about restoring dignity. It's about helping people out of problems. You're right, it is. But if you put a dollar value on it, and you convince the bean counters and the, par the partner organisation that it's a net positive impact, are you likely to increase the number of clients you can get a job placement for? And if you're able to increase the number of placements that you can get for a client, isn't that a net positive benefit in human terms? And that's where the great challenge is, is to combine people in a partnership based on language that the partner understands. In Mongolia, Rio Tinto wasn't all about empowering women, but they had a project that did the most for empowering women than any project in Mongolia. Better than anything UNICEF did, better than anything UNDP did, better than anything that the foreign aid organisations did, and I spent 20 years working in that world, I know how they work. The Rio's program did work. What, by the way, is the only sustainable way to end poverty? What's the only sustainable way to end poverty? Jobs. It's the only way. Reasonable, well-regulated employment. It's the only way to end poverty. Interestingly, let's talk about measures again for a second. Some of you may have heard me speak in other forums know one of the things I hate is child sponsorship programs. Who here has done a child sponsorship sometime in their life? Anyone? Okay, let me give you some data. I love data. <coughs> Nearly three million children have passed through child sponsorship since 1953. A million of those children through World Vision alone. The average sponsorship is $28 a month. It goes for 11.3 years. That's $3,118 per child. Legitimate question to ask. What do we get for that $3,118? Just park that question for a, side, for a second. Let's go back to Rio Tinto and Mongolia. It's a copper mine. They've built 
these wonderful empowerment programs of women, which actually reduce their input costs. But the critical measure for Rio Tinto actually is how much copper are you producing and how much profit are you making from that copper? That really is the question. That is the metric, isn't it? And if we turned up to Rio Tinto and we said, how much copper are you producing in the Olu Toloi mine? And they looked at you, all full of excitement, and they said, we dug a really big hole. That's nice. How much copper did you produce? Well, we bought a lot of really big yellow trucks. I mean, really big yellow trucks. OK, that's cool. But how much copper did you produce? And we moved a lot of dirt from this really big hole in these really big yellow trucks. And we made some brand new mountains out of the dirt from the hole that we carried in the big yellow truck. Great. How much copper did you produce? Oh, we don't measure that. What would you think of Rio Tinto as a mining company? So when you rock up to a number of child sponsorship organisations, not all of them, but a number of them, and if you accept that the only way to sustainably end poverty is through reasonable and well-regulated employment, surely the only metric that counts for a child sponsorship organisation is how many of the beneficiaries are now in employment. Surely. Surely that's the metric. And when I've gone to a number of these organisations and I've asked, how many of your former child sponsors, how many of those three million children since 1953, four generations now, how many of them are in employment? Simple question. And they'll tell you, Oh, we built a lot of schools. That's nice, it's like digging a big hole. We hired a lot of teachers. That's nice, it's like buying a big yellow truck. We dug a whole lot of wells. That's like moving a whole lot of dirt and building a whole lot of mountains. How many kids are in employment? We don't know, we don't measure that. That's what they tell you. Interesting. So like you would think Rio Tinto would be a bizarre company if they didn't know how much copper they're producing, why do we cut the non-for-profit organisations who do child sponsorships so much slack that we don't even hold them to account on the only metric that should matter for the child? That is, over four generations, how many are in employment? Like your organisations, how many of you downstream track your beneficiaries to see how long they stay in employment after you place them in a role? Don't answer that question now, but ask yourself that question when you get back to your offices. Because if you do track that information, that's fantastic. If you don't track that information, that's bad. If you do track the information, it helps you tell you which programs are working and which ones don't. And when you are in, in a competitive environment, competing with each other for limited funds to help your target beneficiaries gain employment, and if you turn up to me and you ask for financial assistance and you can't show me how long-term your programs keep people in employment longer, I'm not going to fund you. Now, you might get away with it today still, because let's go back to the child sponsorship organisation. What is the product that a child sponsorship organisation is actually selling? What is the child sponsorship agency actually selling? Not what they're saying they're selling, but what they're actually selling. What do you reckon? They're selling hope. They're selling hope. Spot on. Where'd that come from? Absolutely right. The product that I, as a child sponsorship agency, are selling you is feel good. I convince you, if you give me this money, sad kid is happy kid, you feel good. That's the product. That's the product. The last thing a child sponsorship organisation wants you to know is, how's that money actually been spent? Oh, we hired teachers. We bought yellow trucks. We built schools. You dug a big hole. How many of the former recipients are now in employment? Oh, we don't measure that. Oh, I don't feel so good right now. Do I? 
It's interesting. I hate to be naive, sorry, not naive about it or cynical about it, but that's how the world works. What's slowly happening now, particularly through things like shared value, is more and more donors, be they private sector or government donors, are starting to wake up to ask themselves, what is the metric that we need to be measuring to make us happy as a donor that we have achieved the objective that we're wanting to achieve. So if you were donating to a child sponsorship organisation and all you wanted to do was feel happy and boast to your friends around the barbecue about how holier than thou you are because you've got two child sponsors and your mate's only got one, then fine, if that's the number game you're playing. But if you're wanting to actually do and make a difference for the child, then it's a very different metric. And as we continue to have budget restrictions through government funding, and as we continue to have more companies come into the shared value space, and the critical thing about the shared value space is the metric has to be real. The metric doesn't come back to what we feel, it's how we value our assets in the resource sector by lowering our risk profile because we've lowered our community risk because we've done something that's had a genuine and real impact, not a, excuse my language, bullshit impact. In other words, a for-profit company looking for a partnership with a non-for-profit organisation is going to want a real metric that they can help measure in a downstream way that then turns into dollars. And when I say this to some people, they say, Andrew, we're talking about people, not money. You're too money focused. This is the non-for-profit world. It's not about money. And I said to them, yeah, really? If I have $100, and with that $100, I can bring 10 children out of poverty and I get a 10% efficiency gain. I don't now spend $90 to bring a hundred, uh, 10 children out of poverty. I still spend my $100, but I get 11 children out of poverty, not 10. Actually, I would suggest that in the non-for-profit world, money matters even more than the for-profit world because you're impacting on people. And if you get an efficiency gain, your ultimate metric is not the money saved, it's the number of people helped, isn't it? So if you're concerned about people, surely someone in your organisation needs to be focused on money and how that money helps people and which person in the organisation should be responsible for the focus on money. Anyone. It starts with chief and ends in officer. What's the middle word? Right? And it's funny that to do good, we need to be ruthless. We need to be ruthless on efficiency and effectiveness of our programs because it impacts on people. So I don't get full profitability in Rio Tinto. I don't get the most effective program I can and, and we make 7.6 instead of $7.7 .7 billion profit. My personal dividends from my Rio shareholding will drop from 13 cents to 12. I don't own many Rio Tinto shares. But what's the difference in the number of people that you impact if you measured that $100 million in spending? Interesting. So what does that mean for Job Australia members? Partnerships must be based on mutual recognition of objectives. In other words, you must help the partner organisation understand what your organisation's objectives are 
and how your partner organisation can help. And you must understand your partner organisation's objectives and help them achieve those. And if your partner organisation is a for-profit company, the law requires their objective to be profitability. That's what corporations law in Australia requires. So surely an effective partnership is all around you understanding how a partnership between that for-profit organisation and your organisation will improve their profitability because if it does not, it is illegal under the Corporations Act. And if you are dealing with a pool of people who when they gain employment are better employees, measurably longer serving and more loyal, then you've got a wonderful data set to show the partner organisation why you're helping achieve their, organization, their organisational goals. And just a simple matter of human psychology. Which person is more likely to have a long-term sustainable partnership with a private sector company? The person who comes in and says, please give me money, or the person who comes in and says, give me the opportunity to improve your profitability? Which is going to have the more sustainable partnership over the longer term, and therefore, whose organisation is going to help more long-term unemployed out of poverty. And thinking like a ruthless accountant is not a bad thing. In fact, it is the basis that will build a shared value partnership rather than a philanthropic partnership. That's why last year I asked your organisations to think, what is the value you can bring to partner organisations, not just think about the value that partner organisations bring you. Two-way exchange of value. And that a ruthless focus on measuring outcomes, not process, is important and you need to be led by a professional board. And we're going to cover this a little bit more after lunch where one of the frustrations is when professional, high-achieving people come and join non-for-profit boards because they want to give back to the community and they leave their business brains at the door and they go soft. Whereas really, the skill set those people have that you want to exploit in your organisation is that ruthless accountability from the for-profit sector where you can say to those board members, help us create the narrative of how a partnership will be bilateral by being ruthless on measuring results and outcomes. And you be ruthless on measuring results and outcomes because at the end of the day, in your business, your business is about people and for every efficiency gain you get, you're not saving money, you're helping more people. Over to you. Questions, comments. We have about 12 more minutes. What do you want to critique, criticise, agree with, disagree with, or question? Yes, the, the comment, and when you have a comment, put your hand up and I'll bring that. The comment was, it can be hard in your organisations when you have volunteers who are there wanting to do it out of compassion and love. That's very true. What's the answer to that? Measuring the outcomes. You're here to help people? You're right. Currently we're helping 100. If we get a 10% efficiency gain, we can help 110. Which loving person is going to disagree with that? And this, again, is where your roles are so important in the organisations because you've got to put that data in to show them that's the impact. 
That's why. Because if we get that savings, this is the number of people we can help. Other comments or questions? Yep. Yep. Um, you talk about um, providing microfinance. Mm. However, you're talking about an end product that probably mm. comes off a production line. Mm -hmm. The two sort of never gelled in my mind, sort of. Oh, no, because you start, I mean, all large businesses one, once upon a time were a small business. And the way it often worked, and th these are a really good example. I've never seen how these plastic bottles are made before until I went to Mongolia. And you get a little tube, it's about that long. It looks like a test tube from a science laboratory. It's a fairly dark blue. And it goes into a little hole and it gets heated up by a machine that then blows air into it, it goes poof. And it comes out looking like a bottle like this, which you then have to fill with filtered water and you have to have all sorts of experiments with it. And most of the companies that were providing bottled water to Rio Tinto were in buildings of about three rooms maybe 15, 20, 30 of these companies. In 10 years' time, it'd be interesting to go back and see how many of them are still in existence and how many have actually got bigger. Because there is no doubt some of those small businesses will cease to exist and some of those small businesses will become medium and large ones. That's how it starts. Microfinance is the beginning. Any other questions or comments? Are you more scared or more excited about the prospect of data and measuring? Why? Just, just use the microphone. Because the funding environment is so challenging that mm. any opportunity to actually increase our ability to partner yep. with the private sector is being looked for right now. That's exactly right. Who's scared about it? Who's scared about data? Accountants generally are not. Accountants, correct me if I'm wrong, you love data. Something at the bottom of the balance sheet and you can justify this number. But it's not all beer and Skittles because some of you will be in, in organisations that the data story will be really good. And some of you will be in organisations where the data story is not so good. The marketing story might be good, but the data story might not. Let's go back to child sponsorships. Have you ever heard anyone criticise child sponsorships before? It'd have to be nasty, surely, to do that. Because the marketing of child sponsorships is just beautiful. Sad kid, happy kid. Hungry kid, fat kid. Thirsty kid, bottle of water. I mean, easiest marketing in the world. It's just there's no substance behind some of them. The data can tell you which ones. The answers to the questions can tell you which ones. And your challenge if you're working in an organisation where the data story is not good is how do you bring the senior management on board a journey to make the data story good? To make the data story as good as, if not better than, the marketing story. You're the ones that need to be the most ruthless in examining data in your organisations because that ruthlessness will impact positively on the beneficiaries of your projects and programs. Hi, I work um, in... Um, a sp I work for a peak body. Mm -hmm. And we're currently working on a, a business plan or a business idea of um, partnering with um, businesses in our yep. region. Mm -hmm. And basically, we're trying to work on some ideas on how to um, engage businesses mm -hmm. for the benefit of our members who are not-for-profit yep. community service mm -hmm. organisations in our region. And so I guess maybe if you've got some thoughts yep. on how we... Um, I mean, we know how to approach our members. Mm. We know them and we know what they do. But how do we, have you got any thoughts on approaching businesses in our region, what, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. things come to mind like, you know, we can give you vo like access to a, a base of customers yep. that you've never had before. Yep. 
or, you know, we've got things to offer them, but how, like, the, like it's mm -hmm. all different types of businesses mm -hmm. and, and what, how do we get to know them and yep. what we can offer them besides a volume of potential customers or access to, pe to organisations? What's your region? Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Let me answer the question in a slightly longer way. Uh, the Philippines is the most natural disaster prone country in the world. 22 typhoons, a couple of earthquakes and a volcano or two every year. Every year. The benefit of being so prone to natural disasters is you can plan for it. There will be 22 typhoons, an earthquake or two, and a volcano somewhere in this country every year. The government has a series of response mechanisms for it. But what's really interesting is there's a group called the Private Sector Disaster Management Network. There's a group of private sector companies of all sizes, mainly medium enterprises, where they have, over time, gathered the data to show that it's in all of their interests to respond every time a natural disaster hits and re-establish the market economy as fast as possible and get business going. Because it's cheaper than waiting for the government to do it. And we've got the data to prove it. So they took a really unusual region, a really unusual circumstance, and found the motivating factor and the data to prove it. So I'd then come back to you. And I'd say, what's the motivating factor in the region? What's the disaster? What's the equivalent of the disaster? Where's the opportunity? For the businesses you're wanting to partner with, some of the words you used are really, really important. Understand who they are. What's driving them? What are the factors that impact on their business? And that will be different for each business. And what are the improvements that I can bring in through knowledge or access to market or what have you that will positively impact on those businesses? And the answer for some of them will be there isn't one. Okay, they go off the list. Or they go onto the list of philanthropy only or CSR only. But the real long-term partnership, you've got to do the groundwork. It's a bit like applying for a job. Remember when you first came out of school or university and you, you, the good way to find a job was to research? It's the same thing. You've got to research what those partners are and look for the right fit. And there's no easy, short-circuited way. Hi, we've um, just done a CSR whole process and mm -hmm. we're also re-implementing our database and bringing the information for our stories mm -hmm. to put into the database. Mm -hmm. And now we're sort of considering where do we go and look. Yep. But I think we do have that twist of shared value rather than just pure CSR. Mm -hmm. I guess from my point of view, the questions become, you know, the training of staff to be able to collect that data, how do you collect mm -hmm. that looking at privacy? But then also if you establish a relationship with a partnership, um, how, particularly when you haven't created that data yet, mm. how difficult is it to gain that trust for that period of time while you prove what you expect to be the outcome? I don't know if you have any experience with that. Take the whole exercise as a joint partnership. You can turn around to people and say, you don't know how to do it, we don't know how to do it, none of us have the baseline data. We have a theory that anecdotal evidence proves this way, why don't we work together to see? And at the end of a year or whatever your collection period will be, you come back at the end and you say, is it or is it not worth it with an open mind? But you partner up with those people if you don't have the baseline data. And we know there's so many areas of intervention where baseline data simply doesn't exist because people haven't been asking the right questions. So partner up with people to get the foundations right. That's what I'd say. The other thing I'd say as a word of caution is... I was chairman of an organisation called the Principles for Social Investment. And we wanted how many companies do shared value and how many companies do corporate social responsibility, old style thinking. And we thought, let's look at the cream of the cream. And we took the UN Global Compact lead 50 companies, that is the largest companies in the world that have signed up to the UN Global Compact locally. And we analysed 200 community interaction projects and asked ourselves, were these old style corporate social responsibility or were these genuine shared value. And we found about 17% were shared value and 83% were all old style corporate social responsibility. But the 17 was becoming 18, was becoming 19, and the 83 was becoming 82, was becoming 81. So I would say that it's only the really leading thinkers that get the shared value stuff so far. 
Some still, most still talk in corporate social responsibility speak, but the momentum's going this way. And the question is, again, knowing your partner, how you approach and the language you use, but even if you're wanting to partner up with a CSR organisation or a company that does CSR, and you went in with a shared value mindset, you can say to the CSR person, yeah, that's right, you're using 1% of pre-tax profit as corporate social responsibility, but what do you do internally when this contributes positively to your bottom line or less negatively than you're budgeting for? Ooh, didn't think about that. Nice story. But it is about taking the time, same as the other question, to understand the partner. We have one more question. Any more? Hang on, just wait for the microphone because it's going on the camera as well. Um, I just have a question about um, the example, the malaria example mm. you gave before. And just wonder if that was driven by BHP or if it was driven by not-for-profits mm. in the area, you know, that, um, that look after malaria mm. sufferers. Because I feel that... Mm. Um, in our sector, we're very resource poor mm. and it's quite hard. I think it would be obviously a lot easier if you could find an organisation that was already on site. Yep. I wonder if that was the case with, with BHP? No, it wasn't and it, it's what strengthens the argument. One of the problems when you look at things like anti-malaria or other interventions is the issue of attribution. If there are multiple organisations working on the same problem, how do I know my spending resulted in that outcome? The powerful, one of the number of powerful things about the BHP anti-malaria example is no one was doing anti-malaria projects in Mosul before BHP came in. So they built everything from scratch. So it was a really easy attribution issue. This spending had this impact because no one else was doing it. So they built NGOs and they built partnerships. And one of the things they've done as part of it is they've got an estimated life of asset of about 50 years. So right from the beginning, they asked themselves the question, well, what happens at end of life of asset? Do we go away and the malaria just comes back? So what they've done in factoring in as part of the cost is they give 10% of, sorry, 2% of the overall capital required to earn a dividend to fund the project each year over 50 years. So by the end of the 50 years, there will be 100% of the capital required in a fund to earn dividends high enough to be able to fund that project on an ongoing basis. So it's factored in from the beginning their exit strategy. But I'll be honest, when they started the project, it started as a CSR project. It did. It was part of their overall global commitment of 1% of pre-tax profit to corporate social responsibility. And the bean counters came in and said, actually, we think this is a dumb idea. It's not going to have an impact. Let's close it down, but let's analyse it before we close it down. <gasps> Ooh, it's making a profit. Don't close it. So it was really interesting that it started as a CSR and then it moved to a shared value. And what that did in budget terms is it meant that the funding for the anti-malaria program was no longer counted in the 1% of, uh, of pre-tax profit budget for CSR. They moved it into staff welfare budget, which freed up more money for the CSR budget. Now, you guys are accountants. You get the power of moving it from this bucket to that bucket. And you look at it and you go, wow, we came in to close it down, we analysed it, and we created a whole series of metrics that we didn't realise before and realised <gasps> it's worthwhile. Let's keep it. And that's why you guys are so powerful. You've got to think two, three steps outside the normal box and say, what's the downstream impact? And that's how I'm going to finish up. You guys are the most important people because you guys are the ones that set the metrics and be ruthless and spit out the results because if you get the efficiency gain, you help more people. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Informative, insightful, challenging. Can't wait for the uh, after lunch break. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Lunch. <laughs>